Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I am joined today with a new guest, Gabriella McAllister, who is a high vibrational healer with connective energy. And I'm so happy to have you here, Gabriella. We've been ch ch chatting offline uh, before we started filming, and you've just got such an incredible story to tell. And so I'm so excited you're here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm so excited that we could work this out. I'm actually traveling, so I'm out of my home state right now, and I'm so grateful that everything kind of worked out so we could be here together. I am such a fan of yoga, and I know all of your background now that you just talked about it, so I'm, I'm also interested in maybe more of a talk about that because yoga has really saved me in so many ways uh, with some really incredibly bad injuries way better than PT ever could have done. So um, definitely have to share about that later. <laughs> oh, so I, girl, I continue all sorts of stuff. Yeah, the, the primary series from the Yoga Karanta is Yoga Chiquita, which is physical therapy. So yeah, a lot of people have that same and you're working. Well, like you do, you work with energy. When you're in the yogic practice, you, you are taking the responsibility. The teacher is just kind of there to help guide you and keep you kind of from going off too far to the left. But you're literally learning how to use your own energy to heal heal yourself because the body can heal itself and I and that's kind of what you you kind of on a broad spectrum because you do so much working with energy it, it doesn't shock me that yoga helped you because you've already were working with your own energy anyway so so where do you want to start start Gabriella with um with t telling yourself or telling my audience about yourself and your awesome life story and what you're up to <laughs> these days and <laughs> Well, you know, it's just, you, you, you pinged on a really interesting um, thing with the, you know, energy and the different ways of healing. And, um, you know, yoga is, there's, there's the emotional component, the energetic component, and then the physical. And so way back in, way back when, when I started my corporate life, and I was studying what I could do on the down low on my own. And now that was back in, you know, I was, I'm 1970, I'm 53 years old. Um, so back then there was, there was a little to no resources to help a child like me. I guess you would call me either. I don't think I'm crystal because crystals are really peaceful. <laughs> I think I'm, more of an in, I'm an indigo. I'm a system buster. I'm like in your face, you know, like, wait, that doesn't work, you know? So, um, there weren't a lot of uh, solutions for, for people like us. And so a lot of us got a lot of damage, you know, uh, along the way. And then had, you know, we, a lot of us tried to be in the institution in the matrix, so to speak, and be good little soldiers. Um, but I, what I did was I think to survive, I, I, I did shut up <laughs> about what I could do. My parents were freaked out. Um, very, I was raised very Catholic, so they didn't really know what to do with me. And it started off as first, um, don't talk about it. So you're not singled out. And then it went to, uh, like in upper middle school, like right before high school, it went to you're imagining things. And so when I hit high school, I went, I'm either crazy and they need to put a straight jacket on me and, and put me in a retirement home, or there's something going on that the world at large is not really accepting. And I'm such an analytical person as well as an intuitive that that analytical side of me, the Leo, the grounding, but the fire, you know, of wanting to um, uh, find truth, if you will, in that way, uh, I just started studying what I could do on my own and finding resources where I could. So I was the good little soldier by day and then by night studying everything. Like I had two different lives basically. So I went through university. I speak three languages. Uh, I was being groomed for the state department's foreign service. I was actually um, brought into the state department's foreign service. I was recruited and I was headed to Brussels. Uh, anybody doing the truther movement and the Patriot movement knows that Brussels is a hotbed for a lot of bad things. So it was really fascinating that I was, they found me and they put me there. And then a pharmaceutical ad agency stepped in and threw a lot of money at me in a big title in 91 when there were no jobs. And I, you know, typical, you know, I'd been institutionalized quite a bit. So I jumped at the money and then started the corporate career. And, you know, that was very interesting because I, I went in there and I, you could palpably feel the misery you know, I was given an office and everybody was in cubicles and 
everybody was a slave to, I have children, I have a house, I have this, I have that. And I have to work at something I don't love because I need the money. And I was just like, you know, the, the beginning of the awakening for me was that job. I mean, or the beginning of um, the aggressive awakening, the, the, the child was always awake. I, I moved through that, like understanding what I could do because I was, I, my grandfather died and he came to see me <laughs> 20 minutes after he passed and almost, I mean, he looked corporeal standing in front of me and he said, I came to say goodbye. I was in New Jersey. He was in Mexico and I, you know, I was five. I run into my mom's room and my mom was looking and she goes, what? And I was like, oh, Papa, he came to say goodbye. And my mom's like, what? And then the phone rings, the call from Mexico that he had passed. And she just looked at me and cocked her head. And then, you know, she was in tremendous grief because he was such an amazing father to her, an amazing grandfather. So I have, I no doubt that man. And he was very religious, by the way. He was a, a devout Catholic to La Virgen de Guadalupe. He would do pilgrimages. So he knew what I could do. And he always protected me. He said, you are one of God's gifts to the population. There's so many of you and we have one in our family. So he was a very awake Catholic, you know, very, very awake. So there was, you know, all of that awakening, but then the real awakening around work, right? And how low frequency a job is. So like a job would be third dimensional, a career you're getting closer, fourth dimensional, you're good at it. But just because you're good at it doesn't mean it fills your soul with joy and peace. Doesn't necessarily mean you're here to do that. I went through a couple of incarnations before my mission and purpose hit me. And I literally hit a wall. I worked for an internationally renowned healer who is as black as night. He is horrible. I will not say names because um, he's quite vicious. But he, um, some people tell me, because there's a lot of story there, like he blocked me from getting um, my own book deal. He saw me as a threat when I finally left. And I wasn't a threat to him. I had agreed not to speak about him. So, you know, I never did. Then he blocked a lot of things. And the people that knew about it said, do you hate him? And I looked, I, it's so funny. The piece I felt was, no, he taught me everything I need to be careful about the warnings of ego, the trappings of the materialism, that that can't be the reason you do something. You, we have to do it because it's our mission and purpose. And then the money comes later. The money comes from the positive place. So this that, journey. Oh, it's go ahead. interesting. I see on my channel a lot that a lot of times these tools, these abilities, you know, whatever you're doing it's up to the person whether they're used for good or bad. You know, both yes. sides of the coin are using the same things. They're doing the same type of, of stuff, but it's it's the intention behind the action. And so you're right. You you think when you when you go to a healer, you have to be very aware and use your own discernment of, over what your gut is telling you about the intention. And so I'm so glad you brought that up. Just because someone says they can do something doesn't mean they're doing it for your best interest. And so I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, that's you're right. And I'll, I'll give you a prime example, a name that I can mention that I have no affiliation with. But when John of God came on the scene, um, I mean, everybody was promoting him. And I remember just hearing the name and went, mm -mm. And, you know, I heard such a clear no. And everybody was like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. He's the real thing. He has this center. And then I started hearing how everybody had to wear white gowns and go to the, with this tent. And, you know, I, I even had a family member that went down there uh, and I was just kind of shaking my head. And then years later, the, the empirical truth comes out of what that individual really is. So, you know, here's what I, I, when I work with clients, yes, I'm doing healing work. I'm working at the energetic, the emotional, and the physical. That was the gap that I saw. Like if I was going to do this work, it had to do, it had to be done professionally. It had to support me and, 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 and within reason, you know, and I had to, know that I could competently do this work, not fluffy. 
you know, not right. this. I just came out of high school and I have a gift. And, and, and that's nice, people. But everybody has a gift. But if you don't train the gift, then you're irresponsible with it. So there's the ignorance on top of what you said, which is incredibly important, intention or agenda. Everything, ha- everything has yin and yang. Everything has light and dark. And it's what we bring to it, which is the universe, God, light, love, Buddha, whatever the heck you believe in we're put here with free will. And that was part of what my work also does. A lot of times my clients call me up and they'll say, after working with me regularly for a little bit, they're like, Hey, I can hear my cat and dog talking. Is that normal? I'm like, yes, that's you busting out of the matrix. That's you using your, these other listening skills are absolutely correct. The five senses is a delusion. There are so more. And And everybody has them at different levels, depending on your frequency, depending on where you are in your awakeness, but everybody can upgrade themselves. And so that was the important thing for me is I started to see the gap with all the woo people that they weren't connecting the energetics with the emotion and the physical. And when when you silo something like allopathic medic medicine silos, they, they deal with, okay, oh, you have eczema. Let me give you a topical cream to put on that. I'm like, no, 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 no. What's going on systemically, emotionally, energetically, that's creating a problem with the skin, which means your liver's malfunctioning and it's dumping onto the skin because that's the safest organ to dump it onto. So allopathic will... Will, will literally put you in a silo and give you a topical cream, which is a Band-Aid. It's not going to fix it. And yeah. so that's where I came from when I developed connected energy, or I, I'd love to say I developed it, when it was given to me in order to help others, um, I realized this is part of the missing link, that everything has to be connected in order to achieve um, effective and and consistent success. And that's why so many people, if they're siloed in what they do, or they have a gimmick niche, they end up being very hit or miss. Yeah. Oh, that's, you're singing my tune. I've said that and I keep saying that on my channel over and over and over and over again. I'm like, the real awakening is when you figure this out, that it's all connected and yeah, we talk about that. And I, I, I come from a family of doctors and I was like the black sheep. I went off to India and Ayurvedic <laughs> medicine says that like you got arthritis. Well, it's not about your bones being dry. It's the fact that you're overthinking and you have anxiety. That's the source yes. of the problem. And that's your body's re because your but the body is the shakti. It's the expression of the soul. And so these issues you have is where your body's telling you where something is out of alignment. And we, I feel like our ancestors knew this. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, there's so much a history that's being blocked because our ancestors did know this. You're absolutely yeah. right. And they, you know, the last great reset was, you know, um, you know, I, I believe uh, during the industrial revolution. Yep. Oh, and you're singing my tone, girl. girl they, yeah, talk about that here. They, they they've wiped out so yeah. much of of what we knew because I mean, you know, they they, they leave us little bread cl- crumbs because they can't hide everything. So you you know you you have your Edgar Casey's, you have your Walter Russells. You know, why did Tesla, you know, die a, a broken uh, man with no resources because they were trying to bury him because he right. was the real deal and he was creating different paradigms and different understandings like Walter Russell was and, um, and, and, and all these scientists that you really have to dig to find because they're, they're, they try to bury them. Um, I really, once I get my clients uh, upgrading themselves, their, their awareness, it, it, it's, it's amazing to watch them. And this is what we were talking about a little bit earlier. So sorry, my ADD and like getting excited talking with you, we could go <laughs> off in so many directions. But when you have, when you get connected, how you know you're connected is that that inner knowing becomes so dead on the mark because it is devoid of ego It is devoid of the fear. And if, you know, we all deal with ego a little bit and fear because we're not perfect beings. We're having the human experience. But the minute you get more into that love vibration, those higher frequencies of 5D and beyond and keep upgrading yourself, 
you recognize when fear or ego is motivating you. And then you go, whoop, stop, drop and roll like you're on fire. Let's clear the mechanism and then listen. And then that inner knowing will tell you exactly what you need to be doing. And you don't need to be calling a psychic 24 seven. You actually have that ability to connect into it and really figure it out. You just have to clear the mechanism, but they've, and you know this, cause I speak your language, you speak mine. They immerse us in fear. So it becomes so difficult to clear the mechanism or it becomes difficult to think, I'm thinking in fear 24-7, this can't be normal. Yeah. And most people don't even question it. But now yeah, we're yeah. starting to see more and more question, more and more because of all the events that have occurred, people are going, wait a minute, that doesn't feel quite right. So we do have like, you know, that sparks, you know, of, of potential of different choices. I love when you, right at the beginning of this episode, when you were talking about being in the job and the way you described it, it like, it's been a, sh it's been a sh uh, shiver down my spine because I think that's a lot of people watching where you've been in this job where you should be, you're being told that you should be grateful for this great job with all this money, but every day it's like, I, I see it. People are, get, I, I live in the middle of Atlanta. I, I live in a bunk amongst a bunch of corporate offices. People look like they're walking in for their freaking execution. So yes. right way to put it. Yep. It's awful. And I'm like, this is, I, I listened to a guy doing a podcast the other day who come out of Scientology and it was so brilliant when he said, he goes, there's a difference between your quality of life and your standard of life. So if you are working like a job where you've got six figures a year coming in, and you've got the great house and your standard of life, you know, you've got the nice meal, you've got the packed refrigerator, you've got the diamonds, you've got, that's great. But what's your quality of life? Yeah. And, and that's the reason why we see so many miserable people in corporate, but yet you go to like India where I are, are a, a, in Mexico where they have a lot of poverty and you'll see children happy as can be. Their quality of life is because they're loved and they have time to explore themselves. And, you know, even I was born in 1983. So I feel like I'm, I'm the, I'm a part of the last great generation where we were feral. You know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, but so I, I feel sorry for our generations beneath me because even my generation, you're pressured, you're pressured, you're pressured, go to school, go to school, go to school, go to school, more school, more school yeah. in order to go into a job where you feel like you're walking into your execution every day and then yep. you're putting that on your kids, but it's how you, it's not anybody's fault. It's just how we've been trained in society. And man, did they do a good job since yes. that last great reset of well, putting us on well. Yeah. They may be a bunch of thugs. Like a lot of people are calling them the elites. If that's an elite, I, I think uh, I, I might have to like, you know, we need to really define what elite is. They're just a bunch of streetwise thugs that have been in power for a few thousand years and they've got this playbook which you know once you understand it then it, it becomes very transparent um yeah and you know i kept trying you know <laughs> so i get out of the advertising world and what do i do i i set my bonnet for law school because i'm like i'm going to help animals and become a, an, a, an advocate for animals by being an attorney and, you know, I, I got in there on a full scholarship. Okay. You know, I, I, I like manifested this, like got it done, get in there and just looking at the building. I remember looking up at it and like you said, walking into my execution and I had crim law, uh, the first, uh, the first semester I was there and um, the, the teacher was one of the top constitutional lawyers in the United States at that point. And I became very interested in constitutional law. Back, back when I went to middle school, they still were teaching the constitution. So I was very much like, wait a minute, like I was 12 going, they just passed a law in Congress, but that actually you know, um, contradicts the constitution. How is that legal? And my dad's like, it's not. And I'm like, then why is it standing? Because people are too stupid to rise up and say, actually, no, we're not going to allow that. It's like people are asleep at the wheel and they're not running their government officials. The government officials are starting to run us. And, you know, my dad was, the, my dad was such a difficult, difficult man, very damaged man, but oh my God, awake. Like in that way, he saw the corruption really, really early on. And so I get into law, you know, I get into law school, I go into crim law, and I really like this teacher because we had like great conversations about constitutional law. And I started to think I was going to go into that. 
And then one semester of crim law did me in. I just was about to hang myself in every class that I went into for crim law because there was no logic or anything else. And he, he saw me in the library one day studying and he came in and goes, you're never going to make it. And, and back then I looked younger than I look now at 53. And I want to talk about age a little bit too, because I know you know this too. And we'll, so we'll talk the same language, but it's really important to address. Um, I looked even younger than I do now. And of course, you know, I said I had a chip on my shoulder about it. And I was like, what, you think I'm stupid because I have blonde hair and blue eyes? And he was like, oh, no, I know how smart you are. He said, uh, you're too right and wrong, kid. You're about justice. And the legal system has nothing to do with justice or what's right and wrong. And this is going to eat you alive. And like within four more months, I was so just inside, you know, the, the inside of me completely rejecting the paradigm. And I, and I, for the first time in my life, I started something, I didn't finish it because I couldn't stand the people, the system. He begged me not to leave. He goes, you are one of the most promising attorneys I've ever seen. I've never seen a one L argue like you. You're brilliant. You're quick on your feet. Your IQ is so high. And I was like, I can't, you know, this is, I'm going to have cancer within a year of doing this. I'll, I'll be dead. And, you know, so I ended up leaving. And again, I was really good at law. That doesn't mean it was my mission and purpose. And that's, that's a lot of what I help people find is why are you here? And not all of us have to be healers, but you have to be doing what you contracted to do. And they, they mess us up so badly so that we never find it so that we never reach our potential. And it's, it is part of, you know, in their plans, but I wanted to circle around because, you know, our, our society is so focused on appearance, right? Um, there's still a lot of people watching celebrities and, 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 and that whole thing about, oh my God, look at that person. She's 50 and looks like she's 25. And, and I actually do have a couple of celebrities that I work with that are working with me because they're like, we don't want to do plastic surgery at 25. And I said, oh, I'll fly out to LA and kick your ass. <laughs> I'm like, don't you dare put them under, don't you dare. I said, this is, and you know this from yoga. If you find and maintain the balance that you're supposed to have, the aging process becomes a totally different game. So yeah. what we're suffering from uh, on the environmental physical level is an incredibly toxic environment. From our food sources are all being poisoned. The medications are all poisoned. Uh, the skin and hair care products, everything is laced with poison. And so we're suffering from the terrain. You know, you you probably know this. There was uh, Pasteur and then there was Beauchamp's. Pasteur's germ theory, war on disease. Okay, talk about like bringing forth everything bad in humanity. So now humans are going to wage war on microbes. What happens when you go in looking for a fight? You find one. Yeah, get one. And that's what we've done with the, the body and other organisms. So if you focus on terrain like Beauchamp's wanted to, and you make the body so strong, then I don't care what the hell's flying around out there. It's not going oh, to get you. Yep. As, and, and then we also have to address the toxicity. You know, the chemtrails are real. The, 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 the pollutants and the food and the products and everything that we use. I mean, it's, it's all systematic. So we age in a very accelerated way and it's not appropriate. And we get sick in inappropriate ways because it's, it's all dealt with. So when people meet me, they're like, you're 53 and look at you. And I said, yeah, and I broke the left side of my body last year going through menopause and my doctor, my inner, I have an integrative med medicine doctor who I love. He's so spiritual. He looked at me as you're a rock star. He goes, how you didn't gain 400 pounds going through menopause, laying in bed for most of the year. And I said, oh, I wanted a donut every five minutes. <laughs> I said, because that's the comfort programming that we all have, right? right? right. You know, yeah. We're all programmed to eat when we're upset or sick or whatever. I said, I made celery my friend. <laughs> and I love that because I actually last week, and I'll put for guys watching, I'll put this down in the description box as well with all of Gabriella's links. But I had uh, my uh, Robin, a girl named Robin. She's a 62-year-old bodybuilder. Oh, and yeah. so 
You know, it's like they have, and, and I, I agree because I just turned 40 and I actually yeah, feel you, you better. Don't at, look. Well, I feel better <laughs> at 40 than I looked than I felt at 20. And I think it's because I've sp as age has, as I've gotten older, I've also gotten wiser because I've learned to love my body. And I, I always tell, and I agree with you. If your body is strong and balanced, you, it can hit. God, the creator, universe, whatever you want to call the whatever vocabulary you want to use for a higher consciousness, gave us a body that is supposed to do certain things, including have an immune system. And I've, exactly. I felt that way with, I'm a huge proponent of exercise, even if it's not uh, yoga asana, whatever floats your boat. But we have been conditioned to believe that exercise is to punish us to get into a size zero. And when I work with my students, I'm like, can you not think about that? Don't think about the calorie burn. I want you to go feel in your body and really feel what's happening in and how amazing it is. The stronger you get, the sweater you get, the more, the more you can drop into your body. What is your body now telling you? And that starts to change people's perspective over what they're, it's not a punishment anymore, but it's a, it's a treat. It's a pleasure to be able to see your body get stronger and to see it do things. You never, there's a magic there. And I, so I agree with you and I thank you for saying that because it is really up to each and, and that is something you like I tell people no one can ascend for you like you and that's your privilege <sighs> it's your privilege that you're the one that has to do this yourself because that's how incredibly special and how incredibly magical each individual is yeah and you know part of the reason I, I loved I love yoga so much is um, it, it, believe it or not it's uh, I work with all species wild domestic um, I have a very special attachment to cetaceans. You know, I, I was raised in the North Atlantic. I was the first person to spot orca off of Nantucket Island in 150 years. Oh, and wow. of course the biologist on board took credit for the whole thing, but I was like pointing out like in the distance, the dorsal fins coming up and I'm like, those are dolphins. Those are kind of big. <laughs> I was like, and I was, I was 16 at the time and I orca and I have a really, um, special relationship and that was really the beginning of it and they're the largest of the dolphin species so the reason i was talking about yoga was um it was the orca the dolphin that basically taught me jesus they're conscious breathers they can control the oxygen in their body the depth they're thinking about each breath that they take they shut down half of their brain to sleep one side and the other side of the brain you know operates everything else and then they shut down another one, you know, the other side to rest that side. And, and they're always conscious that the, the subconscious in them really is not there. They're just a fully conscious being. And part of the reason the yoga really helped me tap even more into that energy of understanding breath and understanding the, what you said, dropping into your body. Because if you do that, no matter how you engage in that, then we're, you know, they'll tell you psychologists, this is not woo science. This is regular old, you know, remedial stuff, allopathic over 90% of your behaviors are controlled by your subconscious mind. People think it's their consciousness, but it really isn't the subconscious. I mean, the, the dolphin, the breathing, the yoga dropping into my body taught me why did I just do what I just did? Why did I say that to that person? Like all of a sudden I started to question, what are my motivations? What is going on within me? And then it's amazing what the body can do. Like you said, this, this amazing body that we were given. Okay. And it is a privilege. It can heal itself from impossible. What seems to be impossible things with the right will, with the right um, intention that the word you use so correct, with the right intention, everything in this life is possible. So, you know, again, I, I get very, um, there are a lot of my counterparts that have their gimmicks. Gimmicks really drive me crazy. Um, there's a lot of people doing relationship stuff, but a lot of people doing like narcissistic tendencies and stuff. And, and that's their gimmick. And it's a, disser a disservice because, again, then you're working it within a silo and you're not connecting everything because if a person has a tendency to go towards narcissistic people, destructive people in their lives, especially if they're an empath, right, then you have to connect that to every other aspect of your life, including finances, 
because yeah. your yeah. health is also included in financial health as well as your appearance, as well as like um, the quality, what you were saying earlier, the quality of your life is connected to every aspect. So nothing can be siloed. And that's the thing as a child, there would be a problem in the house and I'd go, yeah. And then connect it to 20 other things that seemed unrelated. My parents were like, you're crazy. Those things aren't connected. I said, yes, they are. <laughs> and I was like, what are you thinking mom and dad? Yes, of course they are. Um, so this is the thing that my work will do. It's not just coming to me as to get something fixed. People upgrade they start upgrading themselves and they need me less and less. And so that my clients that have been with me for a long time, they'll come to me once a quarter just to get a tuna. Um, right. If you hear ambient noise, I have a very large all black German shepherd who's part wolf, who is, um, we're close to his lunchtime. So he just pinged me right now. <laughs> he went, yo, you ma. Know, so we, we, love, we love our dogs. My, my dog is actually with my boyfriend right now at our yoga shala, but my dog, it's so interesting. I can't, I want to introduce you to my friend, Catherine Edwards, because she does a lot with animals as well. My dog is a rescue. He's a street dog from India. And um, oh, I, I have learned, I grew up with domesticated dogs. And so with Ravi, it has, he has taught me because he is, he's, as a trainer said to us once, he's part wild. And so I watch, I've learned a lot about myself watching him because animals don't have ego. They're working and, and he's so, and I, the other night we were laughing because he'll get up, he'll be laying in his bed and it'll get up and he'll just come bop you with this snout and then he'll come get back down. But what he's doing is he's kissing you. He yes. figured out that we were like, so he doesn't lick, he comes and bops you and it's a kiss. And we were just laughing and we're like, thank you, Ravi. Like, thank you, buddy. You know, like giving us affection and how they're learning to mimic that affection. And that's, that's what they, they truly love you. Uh, and so that's... we love our dogs on this channel. <laughs> yeah. You know, with, with, with dogs, it's, you've got, you've brought up a really great point. You and I have that in common. Um, I've worked with wolves. I've worked with domesticated dogs. I worked with a, a Cherokee woman uh, who had a wolf rescue and a lot of Arctic wolves, timber wolves. Uh, one of her Arctic wolves adopted me, basically. A big female. She was beautiful. She had cancer, so she had one of her legs amputated. And um, it was the end of that um, encounter. Uh, the Native American um, Cherokee lady, she was so beautiful and she was very nice. She gave me this necklace carved in bone. Uh, it was bison bone and it was a white bison. And so we had gone there to film. That's where I met the guy from the FBI. And um, she was very, um, very quiet towards me when she met me. I, you know, uh, you guys are going to laugh. So I went through menopause and my hair went darker. <laughs> so here I was ready to go platinum, you know, ready, you know, like kind of excited for it. And all of a sudden it's like my hairdresser was like, you have no gray, you have no white, you're, you're going dark. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, that I higher vibration. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll roll with this. So I was blonde back then. And I had, you know, my blue eyes and, you know, it was, yeah, I, I look very, you know, I'm European descent. So um, she wasn't really pleased about having this little white blonde haired Hollywood healer coming in doing a TV show with her wolves, but they paid her a lot of money. So she took the money because she needed it for the wolves. And then by the end of the day, she'd named a baby wolf after me that had just been born um, an alpha female. And then she gives me this necklace and said, I've never met one. I've never met a white person who's actually a white buffalo. You are a, a shaman. You're a shaman. You're a healer. Oh, she wow. said, and so she goes, you, you keep this to remember who you are always. And I was like, I mean, I, I just, she, and then she let me hold, she never let anyone hold the baby wolves. And she let me hold the wolf she named after me. And I like broke down crying because I've always had a special connection with wolves. Um, and I, and I wanted to bring up your point is incredibly valid. Working with both domesticated and wild animals, you have to under, you can't just communicate with them. That's what, again, what I'm starting to teach. I have a master module on it that people can start to learn the differences of how I communicate with animals. Um, you can talk to another human being like you and I are talking, but if, if I don't understand you and I'm trying to help you and I don't have emotional literacy communication skills, I don't understand psychology, I don't understand behavior, I don't understand your individual circumstances, I don't understand your background, your history, 
you're going to say a lot of things to me and what those things may be may not be helpful to helping you where you want to go. And the same applies to animals. Um, they sometimes don't even know what's wrong with them. They sometimes, um, and some of them, like, you know, my last dog, uh, Baldor, an East German dog, another big black dog. Uh, I worked with a very well-known DVM. One of the, um, she was a holistic DVM, one of the pioneers. She's in her eighties now she's retired. So I go to this famous woman and, and I said, I can't, I can't read him. I said, I think my mojo's off with him. Something's wrong with my radar, maybe because he's mine. You know, again, you have to get, get out of your ego and search for help because it, it may be a different individual that you, that, you know, a person needs or a dog needs, you know. So after three and a half hours in her office, in her home office, she looked at me and she went, he has rejected over 140 remedies. And I went, okay. And she goes, it's not you. He wants to fix himself. You're busy fixing the world. He doesn't want you to have to fix him now. So he thinks he can do it. And until he realizes he needs help, no one can fix him. And she's like, I've never met a dog like this. And of course I meet you. You're extraordinary. You're the next generation. She goes, of course you'd attract a dog like this. And I was like, okay. And it was only it was five years later that he realized he was going to die and he decided he wanted to stay and he allowed someone to help him, including myself. And so you, you really have to, animal communication is not simply being able to hear them. There is so much more to it in order to be effective. And so when you're dealing with wild, like you are, okay, the, um, and feral is a bad word. I'm glad you used wild because feral in the community is a dirty word. It, it means a problem. It means, you know, once, once wild, then domesticated. It, it usually has a very negative connotation with it. So wild is good. Um, wild beings are independent thinkers. They don't need you to survive. You're a nice to have because, hey, you bring the grocery store home to them. <laughs> they don't have to go looking for their sustenance. But yes. do they need you to get it done? No. So they, it's, it's a very different paradigm in communication. It's a very different paradigm in, um, I won't say, you know, we all use the word training. I know how to train dogs. I've heard, I've had personal protection dogs. I, I don't claim to be a trainer because I'm not, but Warren will say you're damn good at training. And I said, yeah, but that's, that's not my niche. My, my I, I do something bigger than that. And I said, uh, I would prefer to refer to a trainer if that's what's needed on the behavior level. But um, education and training com becomes completely different. Like uh, the little boy that just pinged me about food. And he was so nice. As I was talking to you, I was telling him, I'm working to help others understand dogs like you better. So give me a little more time. And he jumped back on the bed and he went back to sleep. God bless him. And he's only two and a half. This is, that's uh -huh. a lot for a young, young dog. Young yeah, one. Yes. Very young. And he's not a dog. He is um, part wolf. Um, so I met his sire and uh, the lady's like, oh, this is from Germany, blah, 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 blah. And the way the sire met me was only one other species has met me that way. And I looked at the woman. I said, are you sure? She goes, I I'm, I'm sure I have all his papers. And I said, I were you, I do some blood work and genetic testing because I think you're going to find something really interesting that he's part wolf because only wolves greet me in that fashion. And he just greeted me in that exact fashion. I said, so if I were you, I do the, you know, I do the genetic testing. The sire came back, uh, you know, 30 or 40% wolf, something like that. And she was stunned um, because he looks, he looks like a long haired black German shepherd, but the way he looks at you and the way he communicates uh, very, very different. So, this is his son. And so there's, um, he's not independent thinking, but he's very intelligent. He has a crazy sense of humor. He's very intuitive. He's very psychic. He's got that kind of wildness to him in his connection and his discernment, even at two is, is quite extraordinary. So there's a lot that I'm so glad you brought that up about your experience with your furred friend because there's a lot more to animal communication than the prayer, the, you know, than the famous people that have made money writing books on. There's so much more to it because um, they may be doing some of the skills that I teach, but they don't articulate it that way. So people just see them as extraordinary rather than, well, if you know how to do all these other pieces, you understand animal behavior, animal psychology, the breed, 
the gender, the, the background, the history, da 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 then you can effectively communicate with that individual. But if you don't understand all those things, there's no way for you to do it. So too many people go into animal communication without really studying the individuals that they're working with, whether it's a different breed or a wild species. Because I've even talked with snakes. I've had to... Um, God, I feel like I'm rambling and talking so much. So far. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm like, I think I, we're going to have to have you back for multiple episodes because this is so freaking fascinating. No, I love it. And all of our viewers are animal lovers too. So this is well, fascinating. We had this, um, we did this big event with a rescue. I still sit on the board of directors for Rescue Me Incorporated in Los Angeles. If you want to donate Rescue Me Incorporated in Los Angeles, every penny, they have a 25 year pristine history. Very unlike many rescues. Warren actually sits on their board. He doesn't sit on a lot of boards. So it's, they're small, but they do the right thing. They take the animals that nobody wants. All the other rescues are fighting for puppies and the fluffy things that they just have to wash and clean up. And we're taking the one eyed, two legged, you know, we take the ones that people give up on. And, 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 and that's, that's why I stay with rescue me, but we did it a big event. Um, they opened up a shelter for us. And they and very rare that a a city shelter will let you a, a rescue have hold and, and do an adoption event. And so there was a snake there, a big python. And this was back in the height of Harry Potter. <laughs> so there were all these kind of kids like poking at the glass. And I, I finally came over because the snake was really upset. And I said, please don't do that. I said, he finds that to be very rude. I said, how would you like if you were in a box and people were poking at you? The kids were like, he doesn't know what's going on. And I said, oh, yes, he does. And they said, okay, fine, prove it. And I looked at the snake and I said, and this is really important for people, for viewers to understand. You don't ask any animal to do anything that isn't collaborative and for their well-being as well as your well-being. So commands are not to show people you have control over your dog. They are educational tools to keep you both safe in a human society. So other animals have to learn all of our freaking rules, which are usually counter to their yeah. rules. So dog rules are totally different from human rules. And these poor animals have to learn both. And most people just have a dog locked up in their house and you they don't consciously understand this. And I, I hope that really resonates with a lot of your viewers. So I, I look at this snake and I, I said to the snake, you know, within my head, I said, these kids want you to show, and actually, no, I said it out loud because I needed the kids to hear what I was doing. I said, these children want to know that you actually understand me. I'm not asking you for a trick. I said, I'm asking you to be an ambassador to help these children understand that you're sentient. So help me by going up the glass, coming down the glass, and then turning directly at me and locking eyes. And the snake said, is this absolutely necessary? And I went, do you want them to stop knocking on your freaking glass? And he said, yes. And I said, then it's absolutely necessary. I said, sometimes humans are just plain stupid. Sometimes and he went, okay. Assholes too. So, you know. Uh-huh. And the parents were looking at me. I said, no, no disrespect people. But I said, watch. And the snake went all the way up, came all the way down, turned his head, looked directly at me. And the kids all screamed and said, um, what, what was that thing that they called them? Um, something uh, in Harry Potter where they speak snake, uh, something okay. mouth. I forget the term for it in Harry Potter, but they were like, um, she speaks, you know, snake, <laughs> like Harry Potter. <laughs> I was like, oh, did we learn nothing? <laughs> or just Harry Potter. I was about to say, like, this, this episode, though, might stick in their memory. You might have actually changed these children by actually rec at a young age recognizing that this is, po this is a possibility and maybe their trajectory with how they treat other living beings might change because of that. That, that is my hope with anything that I do. I mean, I've been doing distance work. It was weird because um, I know a lot of people like to meet me in person, but I've only done distance. So location is not an issue for me. So like one of the things that happened is uh, a friend of mine, he runs Darwin's um, raw food for dogs. He was one of the first raw food makers. They do everything organic, clean. Darwin's is amazing. Um, I don't work for any companies and nobody pays me. If I plug somebody, it's because I believe in it. Um, that's another thing I learned from business too. Too many holistic vets are out there with their own products and their faces all over everything, trying to make more money. And it's just like, you know, be in integrity and you don't have to like pander in that way, because then we don't know if the product is good for the individual or if the product just lines your park pocket more, you know, it's, 
it's a really weird dance with products. So I, I try to stay away from endorsements. Um, so Darwin's, I, you know, he, James called me up and he said, uh, I just rescued a dog and the dog's like out of control. And, and I said, okay, oh, I'm going to send you a picture. Don't. I said, please let me just use my other senses. I said, sometimes the five senses get in my way, makes it harder for me. Just, just let me get what I get. And so he told me the dog's name. So I come back after I did the session. I said, James, are you sure you got a dog? And he was like, why? And I'm like, the way they're speaking to me is not domestic. And he said, what are you thinking? I said, I think you got probably a 90% wolf on your hands. He goes, not possible. She looks like a German shepherd. I said, bullshit. (laughs) And I said, look, you know what? If I'm wrong, I'll eat my hat. I said, but so far after all these years, I've never been wrong. I said, so will you just do the genetic testing, please? And it was really funny. He came back and he went, Gabby, she's um, Mexican red wolf. (gasps) He got her out of a Chicago shelter. (laughs) Some fool picked up a Mexican red wolf. (laughs) That is... You know, and they had a journey that was so unbelievable. Um, her, she and Baldor were about the same age and they both recently passed away. And so when I found out, I told James, I said, you know, Baldor and Reby are out there jumping over the rainbow bridge, having a grand time. They didn't meet together in life, but they knew who each other was because of the work we all did together. I said, so I said, we'll see them again. I said, it's just, they're out there having a good time. But how wild is that? I, I often think, you know, when we think about getting animals in our family, we think about going and purchasing and all that, picking the puppy, all that kind of stuff. But there's such an, there's so many special, if you look at sto- stories like that, you know, like my little boy from the streets of India, like there's so many, and the father of my, I we believe, the father of my pup, my, my dog. He was coming to visit my house when I was in India and I would give him food because he looks just like my, my Ravi. He doesn't, he's to be potty with the white. It's very rare. So I really believe that was the father. And then months later I was already gone and Ravi was born and my friend found him by himself. He walked in as a puppy and she saved him. And my boyfriend's like, yeah, the, his father picked, picked you, like picked you to take over his, like there's a special there's It's crazy. When you hear these stories, there's a soul connection there. There's an agreement there that yep. their souls were supposed to be together and so especially when you hear a story like someone picked up a damn wolf <laughs> and put it in a shelter put it in a chicago shelter and you know i mean and and she was just i mean the journey that that they had together was so beautiful and and they learned so much from each other and and she gave him a gift that you know even today he will say i can never repay her for everything that she brought into my life and everything that she taught me. And, you know, um, when I was back in LA going through a very hard time, I was, I was at the time going through a transition that was very difficult. And I met this broke down Mustang and we did a little documentary that's on him about on my website about him. We did like the final chapter of his life. And someone said to me, you know, uh, are you real or whatever? And I said, well, that Mustang kept telling me he's basically the only way to describe arrow was um the american the um native american mustang version of ansul's black beauty um he was at a rental place they were going about to send him off for me and he begged me and he was so angry that i thought oh god i don't need an angry individual in my life i just you know this is dangerous you know i've been riding since before i could walk but still and, you know, taking on a horse in LA. And, and then I just was absolutely compelled. And we went through an incredible journey. But one of the things was he just would not relent. I'm special. They're looking for me. And I was like, oh, baby, everyone's special. <laughs> I was just like, and, you know, I bought him, his sales thing was a napkin with a receipt. There was no, uh, you know, identifying markers. There was no papers on this. I mean, how do you find an old broke down horse's origins? You know what I mean? Like I thought it was impossible. So I kept telling him, no, I can't do that. I can't, I was saying I can't do that. And he kept showing me an old cowboy. He kept showing me native Americans. I didn't recognize the tribe, but all these native Americans floating around us as I would ride him in the California mountains. And I'm sitting here like, 
I don't even know what tribe that is. I was like, I'm familiar with the Plains Indians tribes, but you know, a lot of the East Coast tribes, not so much. And lo and behold, he ends up being a Choctaw Spanish Mustang raised by an old cowboy. And he was lost. He was stolen 20 years prior to that. And they never gave up looking for him, for him because his bloodlines were so special. These were the horses featured in the movie Hidalgo. So there's only 300. They're papered. Um, Brian is a tremendous horseman, but he's not a businessman. So it's like their, their security, this very special historic breed is going to be lost. But Arrow just wanted to go home. I mean, there's so much more to the story. We could spend days on it, but he, he would not relent. And he made me put his picture up on Facebook. He actually said to me. And so when I did that, this, this girl messages me and says, I know whose horse that is. And I was like, and I moved to a state that I didn't want to be in that I knew would not be good for me personally. And it hasn't been. And just to bring him home because his dying wish was, I want to go home. He had been abused his whole life, never got to do his potential, never got to be the endurance racehorse he was supposed to be. And I know a lot of people don't like racing, but there are some horses that love to run. And Arrow wanted to be a 150-mile champion, you know, racehorse. He wanted to do endurance. And I did a, a tiny little endurance race on him, and the vets were just stunned at his age with his condition that his breathing and every – I mean, they said this horse is – what a Titan at 26, how magnificent. And he was dead in March when he, um, I got him home. We filmed him. He knew who Bryant was. He showed Bryant that he remembered the farm where he was born. Bryant was, Bryant turned five, five shades of ghost white because he said, he's not going to know who I am. Don't hand me the lead line. This horse could be dangerous after what happened to him. And I was like, Oh, he knows exactly who the fuck you are. <laughs> and talk about being psychic. And, you know, he, he passed away three years ago and then the insanity from three years ago began. And so we weren't able to move. Um, but you'll laugh. Arrow did not want me to be alone in this world. So when I was still in New Jersey prior to the move, the, one of the breeders of the horses had sold a Native American or a Choctaw Spanish Mustang medicine hat, very spiritual, holy horses, only shamans and chiefs could ride them in in the lore so this beautiful medicine hat was in a terrible situation he was only a year old they couldn't get him back i raised all the money to get him out of jail if you will william and i went through this weird experience because he didn't like me at first and i really didn't like him and arrow basically told me please save him please don't let him what happened to me happen to him in the same place and so I was compelled by Arrow, like I, I couldn't let it happen. So I made the rescue occur for William. I called him William Wallace after the Scottish freedom fighter. <laughs> um, and who, when Arrow was dying, who looked over Arrow in the field when Arrow could no longer protect himself? William. William. And he chose William to replace him so that William would take care of me when he was gone. And so now I have William, who's now eight. And he's my final ride. That is so special. That is so, animals are so, horses are magnificent anyway. Um, I mean, I, I was actually thinking about that off of this, off the coast of Georgia, our barrier islands here. We have so many wild horses that still live free on like Cumberland Island. And they're just so, where would humans be with that? And that's the thing too. I think sometimes as third density beings, we misunderstand our role with animals. We think we're supposed to dominate them, but we would be nowhere without animals. We would be without, nowhere. Without, without the horse, Western civilization would no bit where near be where it is. I mean, do you think the United States would exist without the ability no. of the horse to traverse? We no, owe them a debt of good. We owe a debt of gratitude. Like, yeah. They um, and I look at even like my dog Ravi. This to the the history of on um, the street dogs of India, the wild dogs of India. They were the ones that would guard the jungle for the people setting up their villages because of wild prey that could prey off the, the children and the people. And in the slums, there are still wild dogs that kind of guard the slums. And so there's a mutual 
um, relationship between animals and humans. And so it's, it's shame on us for thinking that we, we, we dominate, we should dominate them when no, they're part of our well, society as well. Yeah, shame. I think I'll add to your comment, shame on us for our laziness to have been allowed to be lied to at the level and believe their lies. Shame on us for allowing the disconnection that occurred because there's a great book that folks should read if you love cetaceans. And the reason I bring up cetaceans and dolphins again is because dolphin consciousness told me, I said, what's, what's your counterpart on the land? And they shocked me with the response because the only things I drew as a child were horses and dolphins. And horses. they said the horses. And I just started laughing. And I was like, of course they are. And, and when I, when I fell, when I made the mistake with another horse and I broke the left side of my body, whenever I would come out to the barn, William would go over me like the dolphins scan you. William would go over me and he was trying to tell me, you are more broken than they told you. You are more broken. You have more breaks. And it's the same ability that the dolphin has. And, you know, not all of them want to be in the service of humans. So you, you have to look at all animals have mission and purpose too. Like your dog has mission and purpose with your family, just like Arbo has with me, just like cats have with their people, just like horses. So we have to look at it, like you said, as now we have to re-educate ourselves to dismantle the lies and understand the complete truth of the connection and the symbiotic relationship that we have with every living thing on this planet. Like trees even talk to me. Like I, um, I had a client in LA with a beautiful home in the Hollywood Hills and he was doing some work to it. So we had just done a session for him. And he said, hey, I want you to take a look at what I'm doing. He, it was a Ginger Rogers house. It was beautiful on this hill. And, and I'm looking at it and I'm going like this and my head's tilting, right? And he goes, what's wrong with you? And I was like, looking at the big, beautiful old tree over here. Tree, tree is talking to me like an ant, you know, from the movies. I'm sitting here looking at the tree going, yeah, I hear you. Holy shit. Okay. All the uh, stories that tree can tell. Yeah. I was like, I totally love you. And I'm like, you're freaking me out a little bit. And he, he, the tree had a message for me. So I just went, okay, the tree just talked to me. And this is one of my oldest, most skeptical clients. He wanted, he's the first one to film me and said, no, I don't think you understand. I want to film you to show that you're a fake. And I went, great. When are you going to film me? <laughs> because I just needed help to get the message out there. And I knew I wouldn't fail because it's real. So he's looking at me and he goes, you're getting something. I said, yeah. And I said, okay, well, that tree over there said that you guys cut him and however you cut him, you weakened the whole hillside and the whole thing is going to go to the right down the way and you're going to wipe out two houses. And I said, that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. He said, well, I just had an engineer here. No way. They told me the whole thing is stable. And I said, well, I'd bring out an arborist and then I would bring out a different engineer because I said, isn't it enough that I'm tilting my head and I'm looking at the, I said, just We've worked together for a while. Can you please believe me? So two weeks later, the engineer comes back with the whole hillside was destabilized because they cut a main root of that tree that was stabilizing the land on the right side. They had to drill four holes 40 feet deep down the line of the house and fill them with concrete. So he came back and he went, Okay, so uh, I hope I'm allowed to say this word, but he, he's very colorful when he speaks to me, but it's always out of love. He goes, you freaking bitch. <laughs> and I went, what? He goes, you were right again. They cut the thing on the tree that weakened the thing, and then it cost me $350,000 to fix my house. And I said, but aren't you happier that you did that? Instead of like a lawsuit and killing two people's houses underneath you and maybe killing somebody. I, I said, you know, I, I said, I get it. He goes, no, I'm laughing and I'm calling you a bitch, but you know, I love you because it was just this weird thing that I had. We had done our session and I, I was compelled to drag you outside to show you this. Yeah. And I it went, was well, knowing with him as well. Well, and we had worked together already two years. So he was beginning as a male to start to listen to that intuitive knowing rather than block it. And so now it's like, 
I, I only hear from him now after 12 years prior to that, but it's been like six years since I've really seriously worked with him. I only hear from him if like there's some like critical emergency or something like he, he now, like he used to call me about his career and it's like, are they going to fire me? Are they going to do this? Are they going to do that? And now he's like, nah, I just, you were right about everything you saw with my career, but now I know it. I see it. I feel it. And I went, yeah, and there's no fear. So you're not creating it. You're creating the positivity and all this amazing stuff he's able to do. So, you know, it, it goes back to my love of animals. My intention when I started the practice was to only work with other species. And then I heard very clearly, people are animals too. And yeah. you can only save other species and the planet if you can effectively help the change agents of the planet, the humans, to upgrade and elevate. So then right now, to date, my practice is 50% people, 50% other species. And thank God I listened to not having a brick and mortar back in Hollywood because um, it it's a disservice because I have clients in India. I have clients in New Delhi. <laughs> and she, I she laughs. She goes, yeah, you know, we're in Guru Central and I'm working with a little blonde haired, blue eyed chick from Hollywood. And I'm like laughing. Okay. Listen, I have a lot of Indian students. And when I first was authorized, I got very uncomfortable because I was like, I go to your country, but they show me so much respect. And yes, it's it's and that was that is the thing. The beautiful thing about the Indian heritage is that they know how much it takes to be able to hone in on these abilities. And I pulled your website up. I've got it. I, oh, thank you. Up to an hour here so i'm gonna go Holy on your <laughs> i know and i'm gonna ask you to come back in a couple of weeks time and well I'm I, I, also can we talk offline because i adore you <laughs> i oh, feel like course. i feel course, like i've course. met you before i oh, feel like so. <laughs> <laughs> somebody you know i just filmed for uh, this is airing on thursday although we're filming this on tuesday i just filmed the wanderers episode with mr fox about the volunteers the people the indigos the crystals and i'm listening yeah. to you talk, and i'm like yeah and i laugh i'm like when i pass on from this life i'm gonna be like i need to speak to the manager because i don't know who as my friend emmy says i don't know who left me unsupervised when i was creating my syllabus for this life so yeah. I think about I, yeah i've also I gone back true. into those records and uh i was retired i was at a vibrational level i could manifest anything so i was in a totally different part of the universe at a very high frequency like above 5d like just beyond that anything that we can comprehend and what I understood from it was the rules were, we're not allowed to interfere, but humanity or this, or this planet needed a lot of help. And there was a lot of yeah. evil interceding. So the good guys came in and the way they got into the loophole of interfering in a good way was they had volunteers choose to have their consciousness put into human form. And so um, that was pointed out to me and I also got that information too. But what was really funny is I had more proof of it. I, I was like four and I was sitting in the middle of the field and my mom and my sister were coming up behind me and I was just sitting there and they heard an adult voice coming from me. And my family never used bad language, by the way, I'm very colorful in my language, but growing up, it was very strict. And I sat in the middle of the field. They heard this adult voice say, how the fuck did I end up here again? <laughs> and then they, they, my mom said, Gabita, you know, little Gabby in Spanish. And I turned around and I went back to my child voice and I went back to that child, you know, the human consciousness of right now. And my mom was like, we just didn't, didn't know where that came from. I'm like, yeah, that was the soul right, consciousness. So. <laughs> Go, <laughs> I'd like to speak to the manager, please. <laughs> it's like, you see the babies being born now flicking off the camera. And I'm like, they're like, oh shit. Like I was supposed to go to Venus. I took a wrong turn. Um, <laughs> So, so yes. Yeah, so you guys, I'm going to put all of Gabriella's <laughs> links down in the description box below all of her Insta. I've already looked through everything. Paula sent me your Instagram, everything. So you guys can get more familiar with Gabriella and contact her if you would like one of her sessions. And I'm also going to ask you guys any questions that you have for Gabriella, ask them in the comment section below so that when she comes back on, we can address those um, with yes. the audience. So I'll be, I'll be really good about that. <laughs> 
I, I love to do that. So yes, absolutely, awesome. folks. Is there, is there anything you want to end this episode on, Gabriella, for the audience? Um, this is our time. It's never too late. I don't care if you're 15 or, or younger or 75. It is never too late to allow yourself to find mission and purpose and to awaken to connection. All you have to do is maintain that childlike enthusiasm and openness and everything is possible. Amen. Amen. If you're still breathing, if you're still here, it's still everything is possible. So game amen. on. <laughs> I game on. <laughs> be, be the controllers of the world's worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We survived this long. Let's show them what we can do. <laughs> you know what? I will say my friend Emmy, who's a Reiki master, she says that. She goes, you've survived 100% of what's come your way so far. If I was a gambling person, my money's on you continuing to survive. So for everybody watching out there, you've survived so far. Keep going. You, you are what they fear the most. And that is why they've done so much to try to make you not realize how special you are. So anyway, guys, we love you all. We hope you're having a wonderful night. We've got a holiday weekend coming up for both Canada and the United States. Please be very, very safe. And we love you all. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.